Welcome everybody to ITFA 2022. Uh, my name is Laurin ten Houten and I'm the industry talks manager. Uh, this talk, Total Female, uh, Innovations in Online Distribution, is a follow-up uh, of the talks we did in 2022 and 2021. Uh, the speakers changed a little bit over the years, but uh, except for Anke van Dien from Pickle and except for our wonderful moderator, Wendy Berenfeld. Welcome. Is the mic on? Yes, it is. Okay, I freaked myself out there. Um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for braving the Santa Claus uh, crowds outside. I'm a little jealous I didn't get to see it, but I'll be looking at pictures later in the hall, <laughs> if you took any. Um, last IDFA, we covered the past three IDFAs in a row, actually. We were covering uh, innovations, panic, evolution in uh, cinema versus online and hybrids. So f specifically last year, for those of you who were here, we were looking at the state of play before and after the shutdowns. We covered festival VOD, which is now fairly well known for most of you, depending on the country you're in. Uh, many festivals offer VOD alongside or in advance through the year or only during the festival, but the concept of festivals having VOD is established. Cinemas added VOD alongside theatrical in varying ways. You know, here in Holland, a pate taus, which may have a different offering of library, uh, distinguishing themselves from uh, premium cinema. Uh, we had virtual cinema, um, and Pickle is here to talk about that today, as well as modern film, um, where the films are shown on VOD, but cinemas uh, participate in the revenues instead of being uh, threatened or excluded from them. We had premium VOD, which had multiple meanings. If you're a major studio with uh, Black Widow, it would mean skipping theaters altogether and going directly to their own SVOD, whereas premium VOD in our world was more uh, newer films offered at a higher price to consumers if they were day and date or if they were, uh, you know, an extreme, uh, extremely hot new property. Um, and we've had all the windowing ballets, day and date, short window, early window. You know, it's, it's been extremely challenging, and yet the plus side is that there's no black and white hard and fast rules. So for indies, for doc filmmakers, for fiction, you could innovate in your marketing strategy rather than having to slavishly follow rules the way we did in my day, because I'm old. <laughs> in the traditional sector, it was pretty laid out, and in France, it's pretty laid out, the windowing. Anyway, uh, one of the other things that happened, just lay of the land before we get into the panel in detail, is this amazing upsurge in buying films you may have forgotten about, like films three to eight years old, still fell and fall in the subscription VOD buying window. Not necessarily for the big mainstreamers like Netflix and Amazon who want really current, but the library titles we're finding new buyers, either from the head-on competitors to the Netflix, Amazon, Big Five, or Big Ten. Head-on competitors would mean telecoms, cable operators, channels with VODs of their own. Um, examples could be Viaplay or Orange, Canal Plus, uh, Ziggo here in Holland, those types are head-on competitors, they buy and fund, and they also buy libraries. So doc makers who had films four years old were suddenly able to find new buyers. Um, and then there was the complementary zillion sites that have sprung up in niches, art house and festival. You think of movie or maybe film in, in Spain, but there's 10 to 12 competitors and people could sell that film theoretically to five or ten different buyers non-exclusively at a modest price, but the revenues were cumulative and it wasn't exclusively blocking you out. So you'd have art house, you'd have documentary sites like Curiosity Stream in several hundred countries, but which is not only a subscription VOD, 
but also now has an advod, a fast channel, a linear TV, they fund originals, um, and then CuriosityStream would have 10 to 12 competitors in docs. So doc SVODs with different personalities and styles of curating and buying are still out there for the older library, not just new. Um, GLBTQ+, um, expat themes, diaspora. Uh, it was easier this past year to slice and dice the various buyers if you didn't go for or accept. You, you either were offered a big five deal and turned it down, or you weren't offered a big five deal and were looking for alternatives. Who else is out there who could buy? So that was very, very strong. But most recently, in the past few months, which sets the stage again, is this blurring that's happened. Um, AdVOD is being added, ad-supported VOD, to what used to be SVODs, like Netflix and Disney+. And AdVOD meant two different things. It either means, in Netflix's case, a Netflix light, where the consumer in the States pays roughly half and gets roughly half the shows, but they're paying less, uh, but it's the same content. Or AdVOD meant a completely different uh, buyer and purchasing curation decision of older library supported by ad revenues. So this has also led to some uh, upsurge or in, in options. It's confusing, but at least it's, it's good news. We had macro industry changes on the digital side, uh, bad news, you know, HBO Max, how many followed that 70 or 80 people were fired uh, two months ago from the non-fiction sector, European sector, both in, in, as buyers and funders. Projects stopped midway that were greenlit. That was massive uh, in terms of impact on us. Uh, it'll change, of course, because they will need to localize and have originals uh, in the EU, but that was a, a negative. Correspondingly, we had new big services launch, like as recently as a month ago, Sky Showtime. People heard of Sky Showtime, which is not Sky in the UK, Italy, Germany. That's Sky. Sky Showtime is the Comcast-owned um, joint venture, if you like, of Paramount, Universal, Nickelode Nickelodeon, uh, Paramount Plus, all those guys joining together to roll out a subscription VOD in 22 regions in Europe that are only in Europe that are not UK, Italy, and Germany. Hence, that opens up uh, new sales opportunities and eventually production and co-production opportunities, perhaps to replace some of the ones that were lost by the others contracting. Um, so I think, in general, the only other big uh, change which affects us in cinema and VOD is the fast channel kind of flavor of the month upsweep. Uh, and if it's uh, helpful, AdVOD, the way we think of it, uh, is still a consumer on demand watching what they want for free and uh, the producer gets a share of revenues. Fast channels are more in the world of smart TV. Um, Samsung, LG, that sort of world, and the fast channels are effectively linear television, programmed and curated, old-fashioned, <laughs> uh, but with ads. Uh, but it's not really on demand, and those fast channels have sprung up. For example, Curiosity Stream has one, DocuBay in India has one, and just being aware that those distinctions are there has already been challenging for all of us on the panel in terms of rights and windows. Uh, do you put something up for free that you could sell on a pay basis and in which country and when? So uh, balancing all that together, uh, I thought I would throw up my hands and instead introduce our panelists. Uh, we have uh, three goddesses of uh, film, docs, and digital with us. Um, from modern film, they're going to introduce their own companies and do PowerPoints and talk and everything. But on the human level, Anna, I'll try and pronounce it, Hermanidi? Mm, not so much. 
uh, comes originally from Greece, then Syracuse, um, slam dance film fest, short film programmer at Rotterdam Film Fest, she lives in Rotterdam now, worked with the BFI, and eventually joined uh, as director of exhibition and programming of modern films. Last year we had the founder of modern films here, Eve. Now we have uh, wonderful Anna, who will uh, tell us some examples of what the hell's going on, at least in the UK, from a distributor perspective. Note, though, that Modern Films also has their own VOD platform, so the plot thickens. <laughs> and, uh, and on her left is Esther van Messel, Vienna-born, this is like a movie, living in Switzerland, uh, X from the dark side of Warner Brothers distribution, uh, then went into producing docs and co-productions, sales, eventually founded First Hand Films in 98, based in Zurich and Berlin. Uh, their approach is, I think you have around 300 films from 200 producers around the world. One of her films is premiering, I believe, tomorrow night, right? The Polish, you'll tell us about that Polish promises. In her spare time, however, uh, First Hand Films went beyond just a local distribution and world sales agent. They started funding, uh, so there's like a new element of pre-sales or funding, uh, EP uh, roles, and uh, to her credit, she tackled with vigor the hellish uh, VOD market by starting to deal direct with streamers, whether big, medium, or small. There'll be, I'm sure, an anecdote or two around around that. Um, and on the left, we have uh, Anka van Dien from Pickle. She is also 20 plus years experience, mostly on the film marketing side, historically, then programming and distribution. Uh, Harry is the marketing side, Vedette is the distributor here, and she's the CEO of Pickle, Virtual Cinema. We talked last time about Virtual Cinema, particularly Pickle's uh, approach the past few years, but you'll hear today that uh, they've been going further into a real focus on audiences, which is like a new concept for a lot of people, focused on audiences, events, research, and taking it outside just Benelux to the rest of Europe, for example, partnering, as I understand, with Europa Distribution and others you'll tell us about. So... Um, it should be really interesting, and on that note, I want to thank also uh, Creative Europe, uh, Creative Media Desk in Holland, for putting this together and bringing us all here, along with IDFA. So, without further ado, and before we go into the panels, each person will present something, then we'll argue with each other, and then there'll be questions at the end. But before we get there, we wanted to start with a trailer from AHA the movie because it is a movie that all three of the panelists have worked with in completely different ways. So it's a good springboard for us. Uh, perhaps you could play the trailer? Yeah. Can we get out of Norway? Norge er for lite for oss. Satte på en sån liten bed city i London och skulle visa låter då. We didn't have a plan B because plan B you already started doubting plan A. Klara det då och bli världsberömt. Ja. The first time the Norwegian group has made it big all over the world. Suddenly we were going to Australia with thousands of people at the airport. How do I handle all this? Problemet med kristalliserar sig ganska raskt. Jag kan inte driva så och inte ordna. Inte säga att det är fint. Till slut så står man sådan och har väl lust att klina varandra ner liksom. 
masse ting jeg har gjort som ikke jeg har blitt kreditert. All right, you're on fucking cars. Who's Paul still in the band? Det har aldri vært basert på vennskap. Vi har et fellesskap i musikken. Jeg tror ikke folk er helt klar over hvor store de fortsatt er. Et av de største livebandene i verden. I don't mind going through the painful bit if we can strengthen the legacy of the band. Hvis jeg hadde bedt deg nå om å ta av deg på overkroppen, ville du gjort det da? Ja, hvis du gjør det samme. So, not your average documentary that we see. Three different approaches. Take it away, Anna. Hello, hi, thank you, Wendy. Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, you're welcome. You're gonna sing this in your head for the rest of the day now. Uh, it's great. <laughs> it's hard to follow this trailer, honestly. Um, so, I'm Anna. I work at Modern Films. Um, we were founded in 2017. Yves Gabro founded a company. Production, distribution in UK and Ireland. Event cinema, we do all of those. Um, we're uh, London-based, female-led, and we um, uh, mostly acquire films with strong social issues on their core. Um, we also do, uh, we also support a lot of films by uh, female filmmakers, but also uh, first features. Uh, we release about 12 films per year. Uh, we have a library of over 70 films, and we did start our own virtual cinema platform in March 2020, um, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and through that, we've had over 100 partners across venues, uh, different brands, and uh, other groups, other organizations, um, through our campaigns. And with, uh, so with virtual cinema, um, as I said, we started this in March 2020 uh, when COVID hit and we, um, it, it, was, it was in our minds anyway to, um, to have a platform for our library titles, but then COVID sort of made that, uh, sort of accelerated that um, a little bit and we used that platform to release our new titles. Uh, since the, the cinemas were closed, but we didn't want to just uh, create a platform where we put the films up there and, and that's it. We, we wanted to work, we really wanted to work with cinemas because uh, that's what we do as distributors. We work with cinemas very closely to show our films and we wanted to support each other uh, and make sure that we continue that throughout that very difficult time. Um, so we um, we started uh, this. Uh, we we have we have a player basically that we are able to um, give to cinemas to use, uh, and they can embed it on their own website. Which means that a customer, an audience member, doesn't have to leave their website in order to watch the film. Which is the whole point of this: that you would go to the cinema, the, your local cinema website, anyway, to see what is playing. Now you can also see what is playing virtually, um, and the uh, the idea is that they are very; those two are very uh, much connected. So now that the cinemas uh, have reopened, of course, we we um, we want this to be a supplement to the theatrical. It was never it was never meant to um, mm -hmm. uh, in any way <laughs> take over. Uh, it was always going to be um, a good complementary uh, value to, to the release. So uh, a cinema can show the film in, in the cinema and uh, online. And then we split the revenue uh, with the different cinemas and the different partners because we control the back end so we know where each audience member comes from. Um, and that is sort of a nice way for uh, our new titles to, to have that exposure through um, all those different partners, and it doesn't have to be only exhibitors, it can also be cultural organizations, uh, mm. and because our films have very, as I said, s social um, aspects, we, we do a lot of um, uh, uh, impact kind of outreach, 
and work with different organizations that might not be at all cinema related. Um, and that is the beauty of it, that again, we can offer something that is completely different, but we provide that kind of, that um, back end mm -hmm. and that technical aspect of that. And so in, in this slide that you're seeing now, on the left side, you can see an example of Drive My Car, how it's listed on our website. So you can see the different, different kinds of partners. Um, and then on the right side, you can see an example of a, a website of a cinema that we work with, Home Manchester, uh, how they've integrated this into their page. So they say, okay, well, you know, you watch this film uh, in the cinema. If you, if you missed it, um, you can watch it online and you can still support us. So in terms of uh, different titles that we've we've done in the past couple of years, so the, I, I thought I would sort of show a few from um, 2021, just to kind yeah, of give Yeah, we talked a, about this at the mm -hmm. last IDFA, so it's good to see how it's evolved. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Just to give some kind of context, I guess, on and also just the, the time frame of uh, how virtual cinema was integrated in the beginning, then how now it has sort of changed and the position that it is and uh, it takes in, in the release. Um, so, Polystyrene, I'm a Cliché, Sisters with Transistors and Keyboard Fantasies, three really great documentaries that we released in 2021. Uh, for the first two, the cinemas were closed, so the, the <laughs> release was uh, completely uh, uh, virtual. Um, so, we um, put the, the films on virtual cinema, and the, those two titles were our biggest titles um, throughout mm. the whole time of uh, yeah we, they yeah they were excellent wow <laughs> excellent numbers um and uh, i think it was it was not only the timing that was sort of march 2021 so yes the cinemas were closed but i think uh, it, it's 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 a different kind of uh, it's a different kind of situation than 2020 in a way. I think people had already sort of figured out how to watch different things uh, online, where to find them. They had already followed their local cinema and what they were doing on virtual cinema, so it was easy for uh, for that process to happen more organically. Uh, because of course, it always takes a little bit of time to create a new habit. So that I think it worked really well for uh, Polystyrene and Sisters with Transistors. Um, we had, as you can see, uh, over um, 65 partners that we worked with on the virtual side and uh, we had about 30k um, uh, income from, from virtual and half of it was from uh, our own platform, but that is, of course, that includes all the partners that were using mm -hmm. our platform. Um, and then the other half was the platforms that uh, cinemas um, that ha already had their own platform. So uh, that for us includes Crescent Home Cinema and BFI Player, which are big, sort of bigger platforms in the UK, but also any other cinema like Glasgow Film Theatre, for example, that um, have their own platform and they, you know, they, they put the film there. So it was interesting for us to see also how we are doing compared to how the other platforms are doing and to start seeing how that can how can monetize basically this um this new um thing <laughs> and um we also had a, an um an SVO deal with sky that uh, started almost immediately actually and we were a bit concerned whether that would hurt the virtual cinema mm -hmm. side of things but it actually didn't i think the the um, uh, sort of the marketing effort from all sides really helps the film stand out and people were hearing about it and um, that they could, they, there were so many different ways for them to watch it, but they found the way, each one sort of found the way that they, they thought was best and it worked really well across the board. Um, and Sisters with Transistors was a, a similar situation. Again, very, like many partners, over 70 partners. Um, and we it did similarly, uh, about 25K, I think, virtual, virtual cinema uh, box office. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. bo they, both, they, they were both also uh, shown in theaters when the cinemas reopened uh, on 17th of May. 
Um, so they had a bit of a yeah, five, six K also box office, theatrical box so, office. Sorry to interrupt. Do you mean that after the virtual cinema, when the cinemas opened, they then went into real cinemas Correct. and yeah. it didn't hurt? That's great. No, yeah. Super. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it was exhibitors that really yeah. felt like they could also, uh, yeah. and they were looking for films around yeah. that time also because, of course, uh, a lot of releases were pushed later. Okay. And yeah, it was. It was it actually worked and, well. And uh, the price point for virtual was it the same as a theater ticket in in real life or deliberately lower because of the different experience no so it, we always do 999 we start with 999 a virtual cinema and mm -hmm. the virtual cinema kind of uh, window is always that price because okay. it's a new film and that's the the yeah. sort of the standard price but then the cinemas could actually keep the film when the price is lowered during the tvod okay window so it's it's up to them if they want to continue um, um, yeah offering it for 499 they can we're happy to 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 do that um, but we everyone starts with 999 and also here in this case because of the sky deal we are not able we were not able to ever sort of drop the price of course because they had to stay at 999 okay um and then, yeah, did your question about whether that is sort of equivalent to the ticket? Well, it, it really depends because if you look at London prices, of course, they're higher than 9.99, but uh, out, outside of London, it's lower than 9.99. So it's a bit, mm -hmm. yeah, it's no, sort it's of relevant when we talk also with Anka later because they have a different attitude. Well, in Holland, of course, with pricing, <laughs> for those of you who are Dutch. So uh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. 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 So Next. and then yeah, and then we have we had keyboard fantasies, um, and then here it's a, a a different kind of release strategy that we we use. We did day and date for this one. Um, that was released uh, on 12th of November, so the cinemas had reopened for some time at that, at that point. But it was a really really crowded um, month. Uh, <laughs> it was a bit nightmarish <laughs> uh, because. Everything had been pushed, and we also had a lot of the award uh, contenders coming out during that uh, that month. So it was very difficult um, to uh, to have to engage um, a lot of partners. And the tricky thing is that when cinemas reopened, uh, because we didn't want um, to have virtual cinema replace in any way the theatrical in the sense that an exhibitor could say oh I can't really play the film in the cinema but I'll take it on virtual cinema we didn't want that because we want always to to have that theatrical support uh, from exhibitors but also because it the film wouldn't find an audience it's a different kind of marketing that a cinema will do for the films that are playing in in the in the in the cinema uh, so if you are just taking it for virtual because this model relies a lot on cinemas doing lots of marketing work it just won't work and mm -hmm. we had seen that we had seen the, the cinemas that were really good at their, their marketing and they had the the people to 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 do that um, that it worked really well, but then for films and for for cinemas that um, took films only on virtual because you know it's it's easy, it wouldn't work. So we had the the sort of rule that you have to support the film theatrically, and then you're able to also support the film on um, on virtual cinema. Okay. So we had much, as you can see, uh, fewer fewer partners. Um, so the numbers were also lower. So again, it was interesting to see after the cinemas reopened, uh, because then it went down to almost like 3K of um, box office, and then one third of that was our pl platform, and then two thirds the other uh, partners. So again, it was sort of a you know, okay, where do we stand now? Where does virtual cinema fit um, in this? But the film ended up doing excellently in award campaign, and it was nominated for a BIFA and a BAFTA, um, and uh, in the end, you know, with also with TVOD and and everything, it it has had like a very successful run. Okay. And then, so this is an example of a, a narrative film, of course, uh, Drive My Car, which was um, uh, a big success for us. It was it was it. It ended up winning the Oscar for Best International uh, Feature Film, and it won the BAFTA as well. Um, but this was 
quite an interesting one in terms of um, how we um, combined, again, the virtual cinema and the theatrical release, because the film was coming out on 19th of November, as I said before, really crowded month. Um, it, it started its sort of life with um, a decent sort of 15K opening box office, and it ended up doing theatrical like over 300 um, K, um, which I mean, I, I know you count admissions <laughs> here, so it's <laughs> we all in the UK, it's mostly, um, you know, just in, in pounds, numbers in pounds, but I put the, the admissions there over um, okay. 32 K admissions just to sort of context for the European side. Um, but it was, it was, what was interesting here is that, that the film was playing for six months in the cinemas, which we've never had before. Uh, it was, it was. There was one cinema actually in London, Curzon Bloomsbury, that played the film for six months straight, <laughs> from 19th of November until 19th of May, uh, and it was amazing. It was really lovely to see um, how people responded to it. Um, but we were the only territory actually that uh, was able to uh, offer the film virtually during the sort of time where all the, the different markets were releasing uh, the film theatrically because we were doing virtual cinema and we were not putting the film, we didn't put the film on um, any home end um, platforms. We only did virtual cinema only with uh, cinemas that had played the film in the venue. Um, we had a, a nice um, amount of partners there. You can see all the numbers um, and we, okay. Uh, yeah, it ended up doing over 50k um, uh, box office in, in virtual cinema. Uh, so I thought it was quite interesting that it didn't, um, but it, the film continued to play theatrically even after that, and uh, we made it available on virtual cinema on 20th of December. As I said, it was playing until May. Uh, all the awards, of course, gave it a huge push. It probably mm. wouldn't have done any of that without all of these awards and all of that exposure, but for a three hour Japanese film, it was you know, amazing that it, it sort of went the way it did and that we were able to combine efforts with cinemas on both um, in-venue screenings mm -hmm. and uh, virtual screenings. And then it went on on TVOD and we have um, an SVOD deal with MUBI. So then after the Oscars, the, the film was available um, okay. there as well. Not sure how long I've been speaking. It's prob I'm probably we, coming to an end. <laughs> we're coming to an end, but I, but we'll come back because mm -hmm. there'll be questions, but I want to make sure we have time for the other panelists. But uh, I thought it would be helpful to talk to them about your first feature, film, female filmmakers, mm -hmm. and AHA. Mm -hmm. um, maybe those, and then we can come back yeah. later to if Absolutely. we skipped anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So with AHA... Um, would it be interesting to just say what we did on the release now, or do you want to talk about AHA sort of one by one later? Uh, up to you, Andy. <laughs> I'd, I'd say you talk about your part, okay. but just a shorter, shorter version, because okay. we understand now. I yeah. think the distinctions, I think what's interesting for everyone is the different strategy you take for the different film. It's not always the same. So what did you do with AHA that yeah. was different than a first time feature filmmaker female? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. If uh, different. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, no, okay. I mean, every film has a different uh, yeah. really strategy. Uh, yeah, we, we really go on case by case. As for AHA, we really thought that a good sort of event yeah. based release would be the way to go. We did. Uh, we released the film on 20th of May, and on 20th of May we had this event across over 200 sites. Uh, we positioned it as a ladies' night out <laughs> kind of um, evening, yeah. um, and the and it, it did. I mean, it did quite well. I think the the event uh, box office was 38k, and then as you can see, that was most of the, the box office because in the end it was about yeah 50, um, hmm. but it was. Um, it was. We also gave it a, a window this time, so we we did the event, and then there was a 31-day theatrical window. So if any of the exhibitors that required a window wanted to play more the film more, then they could. Um, so we gave it sort of that kind of yeah breathing room, and then it was available on virtual cinema uh, from 20th of June 
and then it went also on um, Pivot. Um, yeah. So when I say Pivot, I mean it's VOD premium price right. because of the Sky deal. We and were, that's your yeah. ten pound price. Ten pound price. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In your case. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the um, with Aha. I mean, yeah, we can perhaps later we can we'll talk about the, yeah, the, yeah. the other uh, stuff with Aha. And then, yeah, as you said, we... Um, we Maybe one example of the, the female yeah. first-timers. Yeah. I mean, unknowns. I can just, I think I can just mention yeah, that sure. for all of them, it's, again, it's a, it's a different situation for each. So for uh, Murina and for Silent Land, for example, we had uh, interest from Picture House cinemas to support the film. Picture House required a, a window. So for us, it, it always is a negotiation with uh, with exhibitors and who uh, really, you know, what, what the film fits, like, which exhibitor sort of the the is a, a, the best fit for the film, and we thought that it would be a really good uh, partner, and mm -hmm. we we did that. And with Moon, for example, we thought Curzon Home Cinema that preferred to do Day and Date is a better partner. We did that, so it always depends also on who can support the film right. from from that side of things. Yeah. Which one was Day and Date of those things? Moon sixty six questions ah, was okay. Yeah, Day and Date. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And what about uh, just anything on normal VOD, SVOD, ADVOD? I guess in the UK you were limited in the sense that you would have your own, plus you would have Sky or a movie or somebody else. But have you been experiencing this kind of flavor of the month of uh, fast channels or ADVOD? Or have you been approached now? Yeah, so we've been uh, talking with uh, Amazon for their uh, freebie uh, service, freebie. and that's that's AdWord. Um, we we haven't we haven't started anything yet. We're still Pretty in new. talks, um, yeah. but it is for us. I think it's it's um, it's a it's a good sort of it's a good thing to explore for sure. Uh, but we also have to be careful, like which films we want to put on, when we want to put them on. But it it really depends on the the partners, the broadcasters that we we have in the UK. Whether Sky would want the film, for example, and then if the Sky wants a film, like is there a, that's first window? If there is a second window, uh, then you know we would go with that. But Advot can can uh, come after that. But sure. it really it really depends and. Because there are a lot of titles that wouldn't get a second um, sort of uh, yeah second run, uh, run second kick the, yeah, can. Um, then you can you can immediately sort of put that film on AdVod and at the moment we have yeah our avails that uh, we're discussing with them and see uh, how it works yeah very cool all right we'll come back maybe we switch for a moment now to Esther from First Hand Films if we can change the PowerPoint. Okay. Yes, so First Hand Films is a um, company since 1998. So next year we will be 25 years of world sales, uh, 10 years of theatrical distribution in all four language parts of Switzerland and five <laughs> years of production and one year of fund. <laughs> That's the new one. I made some screenshots for you, so it's a bit easier and we don't have to go online here. Um, just to introduce the company, World Sales is, uh, is a business where we work business to business. So this is not for a consumer. So if my brother looks at it, he'll go like, oh, I don't get it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he, he also thinks I should do James Bond films because yeah. there would be more money in that. But okay. <laughs> I love him fiercely. Yes. Um, for, the, for the buyers, it's really important that they can... Um, I am pointing at... It does totally no, makes no sense. Uh, that they can search according to year, according to categories, according to keywords, according to whatnot. Uh, that is like really, really important for international presentation of, depends, you know, yeah, 150 films, 200 films. Uh, we always renew our catalog. We get, uh, we assess around a thousand projects a year, and then we pick around 10 out of those thousands. So it's very, very competitive. 
And I had dinner last night with a friend of mine who's a commissioning editor and who hasn't bought anything from me in years. I'm not sure about the friendship. Um, <laughs> but she paid, at least. Uh. And, uh, and she said, hey, look, I have so few slots. And for every slot, I have 10 films. And I just, I am, I'm drowning. And uh, that is getting very um, boring in the international business. I, you know, it, it's just no fun if every time you offer something to someone, it's like, oh, you know, so don't. So I try to diversify. I'm a very impatient person, so I wanted to do different things. So 10 years ago, we started theatrical distribution. It's not run by me. I mean, it's my company, but it's, God, mm. I'm a boring person, right? The first audience is leaving. <laughs> Go ahead. They have maybe less patience than me, which yeah. is good. Yeah. So this is a theatrical website. It's for theatrical audience. What is theatrical audience? Cinemas and people who actually pay money to see films. So it looks very different. There's no categories. It's just what's on right now, Aktuell im Kino. No? And then the new films that are coming up, and it's very important to have posters. I don't know if you remember. Can I go back? Yeah. No posters. This is just, it will change again. Mm. But So you can see there's a difference in how we try to find people or speak to people. Okay. And then there's the fund, where we just basically spread a little seed money or gap financing for projects that we are convinced of and want to help get out in the world. It's uh, very modest, but then a lot of funds that make a lot of noise, that are seats at the table, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they give you five thousand dollars <laughs> if they're in. So I thought I could do that. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, oh, stop. Okay. No, I just need to say. Okay, so <laughs> I never make show reels. I think show reels are super boring, and the minute you make them, they're outdated. But uh, I was invited. Um, in 2016 to speak on a MIP panel somewhere and they said, bring your showreel. And I was like, I don't have one. And then they said, we'll also pay you 1,500 euro to come and sit on a panel. I was like, mm, I'll use the 1,500, I'll make a showreel. <laughs> and so we made our first showreel and uh, it was very funny, very good editor. The first version was like four minutes of talking heads. And I was like, but honey, this is, you know, this, he said, yeah, but it's documentary. I said, yeah, but it has to have, you know, oomph. So we made another one last year. This is my second showreel in 25 years. La la, happy are we, tra la la la. Happy are we, happy are we. Listen, in a perfect world, everyone would be treated the same. Yeah. But that's not the case. Nobody trusts anybody. <laughs> they used to tell my family that I was just drunk telling lies. I don't mean that I miss you too. Join me as I tell a story we haven't heard before. What we become is up to you. And what I understood is that the less I have, the richer I am.
Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, so for us, it's really important to be relevant, authentic, authentic and entertaining. And it doesn't matter what we do or what we touch, if it's theatrical or production or international sales, it just has to be fun or gripping and it has to be important and it has to be well made. Um, this is a profession, not a hobby, and uh, there's no excuse for boredom. The, 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 worst word, wor the worst word in my world, okay, that was tough, is documentary because documentary is a damn anti-brand. Whatever you label documentary, you have like my husband watching it, because he's the audience, and that's it, and nobody else will watch it. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think we need to talk about, you know, forget the genres, or rather, a documentary can be a romantic comedy, it can be a film noir, it can be a mm -hmm. thriller. Um, I think this yeah. word Themes. is killing us. That's mm -hmm. what I think. Is there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, from the big feelings, let's come back to real life. Show me the money. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's um, exactly. I I love showing this very clumsily made uh, slide because I think very often people don't even know what it means to sell a film. And as we are talking about digital distribution, it's really important that we go from production the. <laughs> You can get a PDF. You don't have to screen to film. It's so funny if you sit here, everybody with their phones out. This is really not magic. This is very, very, very basic. There's a creation of intellectual property. It gets licensed, licensed to a pivotal entity. It gets licensed further to whomever, and that has become very complicated. That's why we're sitting here. And then the reward for all that are reports and royalties first to the pivotal person's international distribution sales and then back to the creators of the intellectual property. It's actually pretty simple. Licenses are defined by few things. It's not as simple as it looks here. There's more, there's... But it's basically territory, period, fee, frequency, medium and language. There's also versions, we're not going to in, go into that. Yeah. If you sell a film, when we work with films that we sell to each other, buy from each other, we don't buy out. That's the old stories. We share. We take risk together and then we share the revenue that comes back. There are a few nuances there, but in the business, that is the normal model. When you sell a film, you represent the film and its makers for international distribution. You do not buy anything from anyone, really, except for a license to show a film, mm -hmm. which also means that you do not take away anything from anyone. So that line that's been fed to you guys for, and ladies for, and whoever, for the last 10 years is like, keep your rights and don't give them away. You don't give away. You cooperate with colleagues that have the same passion as you have, because we could all do James Bond, and then we wouldn't be on this panel. So okay. there's always the passion that runs the business in our case. And then this is the backside of the passion. <laughs> this okay. is, I, I hired Wendy for a couple <laughs> of months and we, we worked out with, with my young head of uh, VOD this whole list. And you're not going yeah, to take pictures. You don't have to worry it. about it now. But uh, it's it's too a very, very detailed list of what rights are actually out there what are they called? Who uses them? Who pays for them? Don't take a picture. I see you. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> I paid for this, so it's not for free. You at least have a nice email to me, then I can send it to you. But basically all the different VODs and all, all the, different the different windows. Not just VODs, yeah. festivals, educational, Theatrical. commercial rights, non-commercial rights, everything. Uh, we just needed to clean it up because those people that keep saying, oh, just put it online and make money, <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> okay. And so if we talk about these, uh, this is from a Netflix manual, internal <laughs> Netflix manual. They say the goal is to be big, fast, flexible. That doesn't work together. That doesn't work. There is no big, fast, and flexible. It's either or. And uh, my experience with them is quite bitter. I mean, I adore <laughs> watching Netflix at times um, as a consumer. Here I was in uh, LA, this was 2017, and here I was pitching, and maybe this is a nice story. I was pitching the AHA film yes. to them. 
And it had not sold anywhere, not even Norway. And I said, look, worldwide rights, be my guest, come in. And they were like, no, 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 no. And then the people we spoke to changed within three months. There were five different people. Every and it got months, shoved yeah. up the ladder, down the ladder. <laughs> and then they came back last year, which is four years later. And they said, but why did you sell so many territories? <laughs> In the meantime, yeah. What, where were you? Yeah. We were making a film. I executive produced this with uh, Motlus in, in Norway. And they're not, you can't, they're, they don't yet understand our business. They don't understand funding. They don't understand the process. Everything can be bought and then ordered to make. But that's not how the best films come to be. So it's a challenge and it's a learning curve and they need to be schooled and they need to <laughs> and we need to listen to them because at the end of the day this is where the audience looks for our titles. As long as my titles are not on Netflix, uh, for my brother they are not there. But haven't you had some interesting angles by dealing with the streamers to be able to enhance your traditional deals? A little bit? Yes, and uh <laughs> Without we saying have, names necessarily. We're not going to mention names. Yeah. <laughs> but in but, a good way. But we walked, yeah. I walked away from deals uh, in the last 24 months in the, I would say, region of a million dollars. Because they were just not realistic. They were not realistic. They were kind of covering costs, repaying distributors that had acquired a film, trying to figure out a way to make it work for the international um, uh, demand, but at the same time not understanding that deals had been made, the film had needed to be financed, um, there are uh, territories that needed to be carved out because they were connected to other pre-sales, uh, also yeah. good deals, and uh, in two cases, once it was a six-month negotiation, the other time was the one-year negotiation, we ended up walking out of them because it just did not make sense. It sounds like a lot of money if somebody comes and says, here, $100,000, you go like, yummy, let's go shop. But if from the $100,000 at the end, you have three months of work, the producer gets maybe 15000 and I as an agent get maybe 5000 I don't see the point. Mm. And, and there was what, what shocked me so much is that they have no idea what kind of business I'm in. And at the same time, my goal as a salesperson is always to ask what's in it for them. Because if I know what my buyer wants mm -hmm. and needs, I know what to offer and I know how far I can go. But with these entities where nobody's in charge, there's always somebody above and then there's mm. management and then there's budgeting and then there's scheduling. Yeah. It's fun because there's a lot of opportunities now, but it's also very confusing. And there's a lot of things that we can do now because we don't know how it works anyway. Nobody does. But on the other hand, they do the same. Yeah. But you then went beyond the big five types and you tackled the mid-size and the niche streamers. The and that's what we're building right ones, now. The mm. And how did that go? So we're, we're on that. And that's a lot of deals that are Excel table deals. They just look at avails. They don't look at content. They don't screen. Yeah. Maybe they screen a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Yay! But they Com buy quickly. But they buy quickly. They yeah. pay material fees sometimes. Yeah. Um, most of it is revenue share. So we needed to switch a bit our understanding of our trust in the industry, see who's... But, but this is now becoming very normal. And so our library suddenly has a life. Yeah. Uh, before, it didn't. That's and that's really interesting. Key. And my head of VOD is sitting up there. She was late, so everybody saw her <laughs> come in. So if you want to <laughs> uh, talk to her, yeah. she's there. <laughs> but, and have you had experiences also with... Um, Advod or fast channels or that, that other world? We had a very fun experience because I was working with an expert. I realized there's a difference between Avod and fast. <laughs> a lot of my buyers don't know what they're buying. They're like, they're, they're nego they negotiate as a producer, especially. I negotiate a, a, a contract with a broadcaster and they say, like, I oh, will take uh, this uh, free online screening right. <laughs> and I say, well, what, what do you mean? 
with a <laughs> well, you know, the week after I said, fine, catch up included since ten years, not a problem. Yeah, and then we like to put it on the YouTube channel of our of 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 you know our uh, broadcaster. I'm like, excuse me, that is AVOD. That is advertised based VOD. No, 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 no. We don't call it that. No, no, but we call it that. So, so it's really interesting. And I didn't know the difference between AVOD and FAST until a year ago. And mm. then when we started putting these rights and trying to learn about them, I realized, or, you know, it's different. FAST is like television, but on internet, basically. Um, so we're going back to somebody curates my program because nobody can manage self-curation. It's, it's torture. <laughs> Um, and that is interesting because it's a different audience. It's now the whole press is full of it. Uh, you know, the headlines, fast is the new yeah. black, whatever. Um, but but the next thing will come in a few months. Yeah. I'm sure that when we meet at MIP, you will tell me about another conference that you've been at, and now you <laughs> learned this or that. And I'm like, every time I'm like, <gasps> okay, uh, it's not easy to be big and fast and flexible. Just as a little, yeah. you know, there's uh, Holland in the middle, my favorite uh, Koreans on the right side, uh, Spanish on the middle left, and then, what is this, Japanese on the left uh, lower corner. When you have a bigger film, it, it makes a lot of work for everybody. I mean, you earn more money, but it's also... More we get emails from our Japanese clients that we are officially in love with, which will who will ask us about every little line. Is this okay for the artists of the filmmakers to and our our directors? Like yeah, yeah, just just it's yeah. all good. But aha, uh -huh, we're difficult to deal with. So uh, some things were hard to get through. Maybe I'll we'll come back again, but maybe come is there to, uh, is there another uh, slide or should I there's go? There's another to, um, little slide yeah, because okay. you wanted me oh, to yes, put I that did. in. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And so, so what we w I live in a very rich country and I'm very blessed for that. And that very rich country has uh, gave out money for uh, people that um, their industry is kind of um, dying because of also corona and digitization, like the cinema industry. And so there were uh, uh, subsidies given out for companies to sustain the pandemic. Mm. And then there was an initiative that asked for transformational projects. And so we developed a project, my head of distribution and me together, we developed a project that um, wants to bring uh, curated non-fiction mostly, also some fiction, to schools mm. on an app on your phone um, where you can segmentize the content, present it segmentized in the classroom or in a museum or in a, in a conference. You show 10 minutes that fit the subject that you want to tackle and then people with one and a half clicks can on their phones follow up on that on the train home or at, light, at night in bed. So the idea to just bring it closer to the audience. At the end of the day, they are who we work for. Right. The artists and the audience. So the educational one That's is called Educational Go. VOD. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Anka, tell us about uh, oh, Pickle. We, we heard a lot last one last market about virtual cinema, but it'll be good to hear how it's evolving as well. Yep. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many of you were here last year, uh, but I thought it might be yeah. nevertheless uh, sure. be a good idea to have just a quick overview of what Pickle is. Um, again, um, we are a bigger company. We also do, uh, uh, since a year and a half, distribution. Um, we also have a marketing and PR agency, which we run for uh, 20 years now. Uh, and six years ago, we started the virtual cinema platform Pickle. Um, and it, it, it just briefly, it started because we have worked so many times on films, um, for quite a long time, together with uh, filmmakers, producers that had put 
years of their lives into it. And then eventually when it came to distribution, it was in cinemas for maybe two weeks. Uh, and then back then that was the, the big window and it just went on black and it had to wait for maybe um, uh, a spot on a VOD platform. But by that time, nobody had any budget left and people forgot all about the film. Um, we figured this could be, we could do this better. Um, we can help reach the full potential of, uh, of certain films. Um, so we decided to ask um, six cinemas if they would want to go on an adventure with us um, and start uh, offering uh, films um, in their cinemas and at the same time online. And maybe this sounds not really revolutionary today, but six years ago this was yeah. cursing in church. Um, and um, we had to fight uh, the idea that we were going to take the whole audience away from, from the cinemas. Um, from the first day on, we had the idea, um, it's not a uh, one or the other situation, it should be uh, complementary, actually, as the, the women here just also said. Um, and, well, to prove that, um, I mean, we had a really good story, but we did also did a lot of research. Um, and it, every time it showed, people would love to go to the cinema, and if they can, they will, but for several reasons, they can't. I mean, it, that was back then, that is still now. They have kids, they have works. Uh, a film is shown only at five o'clock when you're still at your work. Or for whatever reason, you can't just see everything in the cinemas. Um, so it was a, a, a very complimentary um, Story and just to give you an idea, um, um, Pickle is quite similar actually to uh, the virtual cinema platform that modern films have. Uh, the only difference is that um, we have a central platform. So you go to pickle.nl, uh, you choose a cinema, um, uh, and then you choose a film and you choose a cinema. And for every sales that we make, a part of the revenue goes to that cinema. Um, and the yeah. idea behind the central platform in our case was is that we could um, do the central marketing as well. Um, so um, mm. um, uh, a cinema will promote the film on their website saying you can either see it in-house or you can see it online. And we will also do that for, for them, as for Pickle, as being a virtual cinema platform where you can go um, as an alternative to, uh, to cinema going. No. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Trying to change the slide. Maybe. It's... Well, I'll just continue. Oh, oh, there you go. There it is. Yeah. Okay, now aha yeah. again. Now there's <laughs> aha again. It's a bit different in the aha uh, story for us because we didn't um, have aha rights. Uh, we put it on the platform uh, together with the Dutch distributor of the film, um, and uh, but I would I, I, I want to give you just an overview on the films that we and the different windowing that we do. Um, so we offer films uh, in a flexible windowing model, uh, meaning that it's from day and date, so in the cinemas at the same time as it is online, to in a TVOD window, uh, and for day and date or PVOD or what you want to call it, it's um, <laughs> it's an 850 uh, price, which is uh, same goes for modern films. It's, it's we call it an average cinema ticket price, which means if you go to the cinemas here in Amsterdam, you pay a lot more. Um, but uh, in, in some other uh, cities, it's it's cheaper and um, taken into account that a lot of people have uh, discount cards such as Cinefield Pass. Uh, so we, this is about the average ticket price. Um, so this film was put on day and date, and for the ones that were here last year, I haven't put that slide in now, but um, I had a, a, a graphic that shown two films that we put out on the platform, one day and date, and the other one in a TVOT windowing. Um, and you see how, uh, especially for the more artistic documentaries or feature films, uh, a day and date model re works really well. And it's, it's, it's because we collaborate with cinemas um, uh, at, at that time, that, and they will say, go and see it uh, on the platform or in the cinemas. And a dis uh, distributor will have a marketing campaign out there for home viewers as well as cinema goers. Mm -hmm. Uh, another example of, um, of a feature film in Beaumartin. It's, it's on the platform right now, it's doing quite well, also in cinemas. Um, uh, 
um, is ha it has layers to do. Um, so that that goes for us as well. We don't put films on the platform that are not in cinemas. Um, at least not for the bigger releases. It's it's it, it's it's a thing that combines and it works if it's if it's in cinemas and it's online as well. Uh, Shabu um, documentary that won a golden calf. Um, we put that on it in a T-Vote window, so it's there for 4.99. And the choice whether to put it day and date or to put it as a T-Vote is very much a conversation. And I'm. I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat something that Anna said as well. Very much a conversation between us, the distributor, and the cinemas. Um, it has several reasons. It could be um, a, a restriction in the contract. It could be that it is shown in uh, cinemas that have demand uh, a couple of weeks window. Uh, so we have it from day and date up to TVOT and everything in between. Um, a quick question, if I may, about yeah. Shabu the, uh, before we lost that slide. It's more youth-oriented, right? Diversity focused and a much younger audience yep. than the other one, the Leia Sadu. Yeah. Did that affect the price indirectly, or a coincidence? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The, the reason that it was for four ninety nine was because we had it in a default window. Oh. Uh, the, okay. Yeah. yeah. We, Just we, we do see out of research that the younger the audience get, the less they want to pay, and Correct. the older they get, the, the, okay, the good. more no, they can good point. and and. and are, will pay. Go ahead, sorry. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is actually to show, so we, we started six years ago and it, it, it was actually doing quite well. We were growing in, in, in numbers and we were growing in cinemas, but then of course COVID came along and um, the whole cultural and creative sector was struggling with uh, the sudden transition from, from um, offline to online. And it seemed as if we would we just invented pickle for this moment because um, <laughs> Dutch cinemas had, had a whole platform in place, uh, and that was good. I mean, um, they had a it was a way to keep in contact with their audiences. They gained revenue, um, <coughs> and so they they really actively promoted their online screening room, where maybe some were still a bit hesitant before. Everybody was convinced this was the best idea ever, and. Um, so our numbers went up like uh, went up like this. You didn't start Corona, did you? It's <laughs> <laughs> not something that we actively <laughs> promote. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, well, Corona was over, or at least the cinemas reopened. Um, and what happened was obviously in the Netherlands, but uh, also I think everywhere. Um, people were not running back to the to the cinemas. They were hesitant. Uh, I think we were actually now at this point we're doing quite well. But uh, before that we were 25 to 30 percent uh, below the two nine, 2019 year, which was an ex was an exceptional um, cinema year. But nevertheless, it was still not a, a certain. Um, group of people weren't coming back uh, to the cinemas right. um, and also if they were coming back and it was in cinemas but it was in the whole cultural sector they went to uh, they went for safe and big um, so there was a top five of films dominating the whole box office and um, yeah. even more than before COVID uh, artistic films and documentaries were really struggling uh, to find an uh, to find an audience also due to the fact that a lot of films were not released uh, for quite a long time, so they were all released at the same time. So people just didn't know um, what to choose. Didn't know what to choose. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that also uh, made that cinemas really had a tendency to uh, get people back in cinemas uh, and not promoting their online screening room anymore. You, I think you saw that throughout the whole sector, people kind of from embracing hybrids to um, putting putting it away, uh, putting it away again. That was something that we had to think about as well. Uh, how to how what that what meant does this meant for um, uh, for pickle? Uh, we had to rethink our positioning, uh, and mainly we had um, a discussion with the sector. Um, we asked him, is your responsibility now uh, to get people into um, into the venues again, or is your responsibility to make sure that in five to ten years uh, there's still an audience for um, artistic films and documentaries? Hmm. Um, and why sh 
we have uh, taken up so many learnings from the last couple of years. Why should we throw it away? Uh, and again, we were repeating that something that we said years ago. It's not one is not replacing the other. It's 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 um, it's it's extra. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started um, discussions with the sector. And we also started two big researches. Uh, one was in the Netherlands where we uh, start researching the user flow. We're doing a lot of marketing tests at the moment where we combine our online data to the um, physical data of cinemas and see if we can find out when and where people make a choice, whether they would want to watch a film online and at what point they decide to watch it offline and see if we can um, influence these choices. So if people are watching a lot of films online, can we convince them to see a film online? Uh, in the cinemas yeah. and if people are going uh, to cinemas but we see for example um, the, the visiting going down um, for, for several reasons uh, maybe they're too busy uh, can we convince them to switch to online but it nevertheless keeps them with, um, with us mm. uh, and the other research that we're doing is um, funded by Creative Europe it's, it's Europe, Europa wide uh, uh, we're actually researching if there could be uh, what other interesting uh, business models there are for, um, uh, for virtual cinema uh, from the idea that we can keep on holding on to the old traditional ones uh, or we can come up with new business models um, Noted that every territory is different and there's no uh, one size fits all, so we can't transport pickle to another country, but we can actually bring our experience and learnings um, um, yeah. abroad. You're in, just for clarity, you're in Belgium and Holland. Yep. And the trends or the curve that you were describing up and down is in both. Uh, well, the curve uh, for, for the Netherlands goes from uh, this, like, and, yeah. uh, and then a little bit down, definitely, yeah. but still way up there from when yeah. we started. And Belgium? And Belgium, we started after COVID. Oh, yeah. uh, so okay. that's a totally different ballgame. Actually, we started at, at the point um, uh, uh, when everything reopened. So it was, okay. a, it, it was like a difficult period to start. So... Um, yeah. We have five year five cinemas in Belgium, and we're actually at the point where we were uh, a lot of years ago, trying yeah. to see what works and what 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 we're doing works, uh, what the distributors want, what do cinema cinemas mm -hmm. want, and uh, which one is Reachem, the Dutch one or the European? The European one is uh, is Reachem. Uh, Reachem. Yeah, and what you said, uh, Wendy, we're doing um, a survey right now, uh, working with Europa Cinemas and uh, Europa Distribution. Uh, and we're asking all Dutch um, European distributors and uh, exhibitors, what have you tried in the last years? What worked? What didn't work? What were your needs? Uh, what do you think you need to make a virtual cinema business model work? Um, we'll be presenting that uh, probably in Cannes next year. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to point out two main advantages uh, virtual cinema can give, uh, especially compared to a changed world where streamers with their hyper-intelligent data marketing um, uh, mm -hmm. kind of, on some parts, took over. Um, we very much believe the sector needs to, needs to collaborate as an independent distributor or an independent uh, cinema you wouldn't be able to do it by yourself. Um, but if, it'll, if that is combined and uh, we work together, there's a lot of advantages uh, with the data that you get or you can uh, uh, find new audience, grow uh, more diverse uh, audiences. And also because of the limited programming space that cinema still have, uh, you will be able to um, um, uh, diversify in your content as well, give uh, space for uh, for young talent, for um, as we do in uh, in in, uh, in our program Pepper, which we do with full color entertainment, give space for black stories. Um, yeah, it's just pointing out that there's a, there's a whole world. Yeah, uh, is Pepper that's uh, uh, black? Um, so you said diversity. Is it? Are you, for example, collaborating with other? institutions like here in Holland, the New Producers Academy, which is on diverse voices, or in Canada, for example, the Indigenous Screens Office or the Black Screens Office. There's a lot of desire in other countries to collaborate with Europe. And uh, I just thought it would be interesting since you're focused on research in this yep. sector, um, maybe 
Is that something you're looking at? Other regions or? Yeah, we will. But I think that that will be fe be a next, next phase. step. Yeah. Okay. For now, it's really uh, we're really focused to um, local on the virtual cinema business modeling. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I have one more small slide as well. So yeah, you can find us over there for Reach. If you want to know more about Reachem, it's on uh, reachem.eu. Um, if you would like to know more about uh, Creative Europe funding. Andrea Postima is over there, um, <laughs> or you can email her. <laughs> well, maybe just a quick check. Uh, I can't see very well, but if there's anyone in the audience that has questions for any of the panelists, maybe put your hand up and someone with a mic will walk over, and otherwise we'll continue talking. But I thought that you might have had, uh, no, I don't see any questions so far. There's one gentleman in the yellow uh, sweater. Can you pass him? Yeah. Perfect. Hello, my name is Sander Franke. I'd like to know what pre-sale uh, possibilities one of you offer. Pre-sale. For documentary, for... In general, more. Not sure I understand the question. What do you mean, what pre-sales Well, we offer? Uh, investment before a film has been produced. Ah, so that's Esther's uh, fund, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, that depends very much on the project. Boring answer, I know that. Um, uh, we can give uh, seed money, which means that if there's a very good idea but it needs development, we can help with that. We can also give gap financing, which means that, you know, if we have a little more money, we could get this great composer to write our score. Uh, it's different, different forms. Um, it does come together with a wish from our side to cooperate naturally. Um, it's our money, so we want to stay yeah. in tune with the project. And I think what's happening more and more is that people are doing more holistic work, which means that... Um, we're doing uh, research and development and marketing and releases or production and theatrical and international right, right. or right. You know, it's just it, it's become very ungrateful to invest in other people's projects so if you want to invest you in some way want to make sure that you're part of the creative team and also part of the profit right so I guess in your case it's a different type of investment than a streamer or someone putting money in to own a piece of the back end, but they don't care about getting involved on the I'm creative. Sure. You want to be involved on the creative. Yeah, no, but I'm which not is fine. sure. I'm not sure because you don't sell to streamers anymore significantly. Well, they want to develop it. They mm -hmm. buy the talent and then develop together with the talent. Mm -hmm. So that just definitely confirms what I just said. Okay, and uh, Anna, does your firm get involved in pre-buys? No, I thought no. not. No. It's pure distribution and uh, yeah. core production, and obviously not pickle. Okay, another question? Okay, then I certainly had some, uh, I, was very, I was very interested in the, you talk about virtual cinema and uh, VOD and audience, but have you found, like in, in, in a, each of you in, in a sentence or two, is there a takeaway or a surprise that came out of the past six months of experience or eight months, for example, that younger millennials are going to the cinemas and they're fed up with being at home or the other way around? Like if you, just, if you felt anything shift that is demographic from age or... Uh, manner of getting the film, it would be really interesting to hear from the three of you. Let's start with Anna. Yeah. Yeah, I think we we were sort of expecting that older audiences would not go back to the cinema um, immediately. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, but then they were the ones that sort of actually... Um, Came in, <laughs> so they did. Uh, came, yeah, so ah. it that we thought that was quite interesting. Um, 
in general, I think the numbers are still down in the UK. There's, we're, we're still not uh, up to where we should be. We're definitely not at 2019 numbers. Um, it's, it's very difficult because people are not going as often as they used to go to the cinema. So even though they've returned, they have not returned in the same fully, fully in the same way. But also the numbers, the online numbers, don't show that that is being sort of made <laughs> made, like up. made up from from that side of things. So it's a bit tricky because we. Um, we haven't even been now for a year without restrictions. Yeah. I mean, it's we're still, you know, that's last, why last I was Christmas, curious. Six still, months, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. it's it's interesting to to think that because we've sort of forgotten how it was. But you know, last Christmas was also not without restrictions. Um, so it it is. I think that was the interesting thing in terms of um, older demographic that they they did return and we did see them um, really supporting uh, both. Uh, in the cinema, but also uh, virtually. Um, I don't. I don't think that there was. I think in the UK we have a good sort of. Um, um, uh, we have like good like under twenty five cheaper tickets. Like the BFI has this whole sort of under twenty five audiences get uh, really price, like price, price, sensitive. price wise. Yeah. But we but we, we we should also remember that we are at a point right now with energy prices going up with the crisis. Like if we're we're not in a financial situation where twenty five year olds are not okay, but 30-year-olds are okay to pay <laughs> this number and those yeah, amounts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that is also something really interesting that we're starting to see now, that it, we, we are missing that 25 to 30 perhaps because... The, the the we're not you're not there as a yeah. 30 year old also to maybe mm. you were 20 years ago or maybe mm. you were 10 years ago mm. um so that has been also interesting to to observe and of course that we we've observed that the, the habits have changed so habits have changed the the people are watching a lot of things online but it is very difficult when you have a million subscription options and so many other uh films to compete with how do you make your film to stand out Standard. or how do you make virtual cinema uh, part of the process how do you you make it stand out so it, it is uh, yeah those are sort you of the focus thing. on events a lot. we do focus on events and yeah. that, event screenings and, and those have um, have have worked better uh, because there is always the, this incentive let's let's go out now and catch this event on this day but again, the event also took a long time to yeah, yeah, to yeah. work. I mean, we we also saw national theatre productions like mm -hmm. struggling as well, and you know those were those were, were always sold out immediately. It it really it it, to, it took some time to get there. It's getting there, but still, exhibitors are quite hesitant to uh, put like a Q and A into mm -hmm. their schedule yeah, because yeah. like mm, they haven't been working really well so again there has to be we're not going to go back to where we were no, like, no, that's no. not the, that's not how we should be looking at it we should be finding new ways, new of, ways. of creating yeah. a new reality because yeah. that's where we're at so it is a very interesting time challenging but also very interesting time so yeah, yeah. I guess those are the, the I noticed another we've... question or comment too from the audience maybe we'll switch back if uh we get a mic over here, please. Thank you. And then in the back, uh, you put your hand up. I think yeah, that's right. Okay. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if um, your name, sir. Yeah, uh, my, my name is Bjorn. I'm from Norway. Okay. A lot of Bjorns in Norway, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you did uh, Tivo, did you do geo blocking to preserve uh, future possible international sales? Always. And if you did, did did it in any way harm possible street, uh, sales to global streaming companies? Or, yeah. Well, I mean, she's, of course, uh, of course yeah, of course, yeah. We, we, we have to because we only have the rights to the UK and Ireland, so we, we have to always have them uh, geo blocked. So, yeah, for us, it's, uh, it's, those are the rights that we have. So. <laughs> but of course, it's interesting to play. That we can come from two sides, that I can have an offer and then I can, they can go to their yeah. VOD people and say, we have a great offer for more than this territory and then it can push the price up. As a, uh, I can jump in there for a minute. As a general rule, most platforms in VOD, SVOD, accept 
TVOD before. Most of them, 90%. Mm -hmm. A big Netflix deal or something like that generally will not. They want to be the first window. Same with Orange in France. Mm -hmm. So there are some exceptions, but in general, TVOD before is just like theatrical or anything. It helps with the marketing and the promotion. Mm -hmm. Um, and for the other gentleman who had talked about uh, pre-buys with streamers, the only tip I can suggest is the mid-sized streamers are not likely to invest in a pre-buy if your work isn't already on the platform and they don't know who you are. The risk is too high. So it's another reason to try to sell some of the older library, get into the pipeline of a streamer, and then it's easier to pitch, by the way, I have a new concept because you're not as, the risk is already there to pre-buy. Anyway, um, there was another woman in the back, if you could pass the, sorry, just wait a minute for the audience, it, it'll come, otherwise no one hears. Ah, and someone behind, okay. And that'll probably be the last audience question. Yeah. So, my name is Elena, I am from Italy. Ah. Many Elena also in Italy, I think so. But I have a question because I didn't understand if you work directly with uh, just with this distribution company or also with producer, and how is the share revenues with production companies, for example, if yes? Who are you asking? Uh, I mean, uh, the streamers, the cinema events. Uh, yes. Ah, the virtual cinema. The virtual sh cinema. Are you working with, with producer. producer also, or just with the distribution company? So no, also anchor. with also with producers. Mm -hmm. uh, any rights holder we can work with. Uh, the only thing is that what we do on Piccolis, it, it has to be um, uh, a collaboration with cinemas as well. Uh, so if you want to have a film, if we, if you want us to sh uh, offer a film, mm -hmm. um, there has to be a connection with cinemas. Now after COVID, we've taken that a little bit m more loose. Looser. So if a cinema would want to promote, uh, um, uh, that would be okay. But it has to be like a like a triangle. So you have to contact the cinema first. I didn't understand. Sorry. So. The yeah. cinema has to decide, not you, the cinema. Eventually, Both. yes. Huh. If you want it, like it to really like have it black and white, the cinema would decide. Yeah, it's the cinemas that curate the platform, in fact. Ah, okay. Yeah, and in, and in your case, and they yeah. also put marketing into it. Exactly. So if they're going to the spend on marketing. Yeah, yeah, the whole idea behind the, the platform is that we do one side of the marketing, but the really, really important side of the marketing are the 39 cinemas in the Netherlands and the five cinemas in Belgium that we work with. They have to put the film out there uh, um, and get it known by their audiences. Ah, uh, okay. Did you want to say? Okay, anything? I understand. Okay, well, we're, I believe, out of time. So I want to thank everyone for attention. We'll all be lingering around after if you have some last questions. But thanks for your attention. Thanks to all. Thanks to the panelists.